I graduated high school, I was, uh, maybe because I didn't have much of a role model, I was always trying to prove myself, so I was always challenging. Um, even though every time I challenged, came up I, and I achieved it, I still didn't get the confidence of it. The girl I was going with at the time decided to go to college. She said, what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know, what are you going to do? She said, I'm going to go to college. I said, okay, I'll go to college. We were there maybe two months and she broke up with me. <laughs> so there I was in college in 1965. Um, uh, and of course, with such a great career decision model that I used, uh, I didn't, didn't stay there much longer after that. I remember going down to a church in Fitzhugh Street. There was a Sergeant Flota, Sergeant First Class, and I said, I want to be a Green Beret. And he said, well, you can't enlist as a Green Beret, he said, but I think I can get you into airborne infantry, <laughs> as if that was a real hard thing to do. Gary Bykirk enlisted in the Army and eventually earned his way into the U.S. Army's Special Forces. Following a deep desire to help others, he received his advanced training as a medic. Not long after, he found himself in the wilds of Vietnam. Our first operation was um, off of Entree Island to acclimatize yourself to Vietnam. The, the culture, the heat, temperature, conditions, everything that was there. And that was a challenge, but it still wasn't like it was um, like it was real. And it was kind of like still watching a movie, maybe. But then after first actual combat um, casualty, watching somebody get get hit, watching what it does, dealing with it afterwards, became very real very quickly. And you. Um, You really start to begin to fight uh, having the walls and the doors close in your life because you know that once those doors close, it's going to be awfully tough to get those open again. But you know that if they don't close, some pretty precious parts of you are going to die. In 1967, Bykirk was serving with the 5th Special Forces Group operating out of Kuntum Province. There, he and his 12-man team were assigned to protect a village of Montagnard tribesmen in the province's central highlands. Most people don't realize this, but Special Forces really is teachers above all else, because that was our job. Um, we were to go in and we were to uh, bond with the civilians in the area and to find those that we could utilize and train them to become um, our assistants. I fell in love with Vietnam, maybe because I moved around so much and I never really had a home. But for me, I went native. I, I lived with the mountain yards in the jungle, um, in, our, in our jungle camp. And uh, there'd be days that I wouldn't even speak any English. I was a 23-year-old kid, but who was responsible for the welfare of the 2,300 people in the camp. There were men, women, um, children, the 12 Americans. And we had about 400, 500 men who actually bore arms. The rest were all women and kids. Early morning of April 1st, 1970, North Vietnamese decided to overrun the camp. So they started shelling, rocket incoming artillery. I remember seeing artillery round explode and two of the yards getting blown apart and I hit cover, and then I saw one guy that was still wounded right there. So I started trying to patch up some of his wounds, and uh, I heard another 122 coming in. You could tell a 122 millimeter rocket, it sounded like a train coming. I remember feeling like I got kicked by a horse. And I remember trying to get up, and I couldn't move. Um, and I found out that what had happened was that the shrapnel embedded in the spinal column and knocked out my spinal cord. It was like a concussion to the spinal cord and I couldn't move. Badly wounded and unable to walk, 
Bykirk enlisted the aid of two of his Montagnard assistants who carried him around the compound to help the wounded. Not many people know what it's like to be under fire and then have somebody yell out medic, except those who are medics. And they don't know what takes place inside of you that causes you to get up and go when everybody else is hiding, you know, and ducking. Boxy, which is Vietnamese for dock. I hear that all the time. At night when I try to sleep, I hear calls of Boxy, Boxy, and screams. I remember going over and trying to help the other medic, Dan. I remember doing some surgery while Dan, helping Dan tie off some, some bleeders, doing some other surgical procedures, but I collapsed. And uh, when Dan finally took a look at me, the, I had gotten shot and run to come through here and come out here. And he said, oh my God, you're, and I said, Dan, you don't say that. You know, that's one of the things we learned in medic is you don't stand over a guy and go, oh my God. You know? <laughs> but I said, I remember telling Dale, I said, if I'm gonna die, I'm not dying down here, Dale. Get me out of here. Bleeding heavily and barely conscious, Bykirk returned to the battlefield and was dragged from one wounded comrade to the next, administering aid until he could no longer carry on. But the last thing I remember is seeing this chopper come in and they just burst forth and they ran and they literally threw me on the chopper. And I just remember these hands grabbing me and th throwing me into the chopper and them immediately sticking IVs in me and saying, you're okay, you're okay. I finally did get out and I went back to college, um, switched my major to pre-med because now I thought I was on a, a better career path something that I really wanted. But um, it wasn't too long, maybe three or four months, 1971 college campuses were not the place to be for a military guy. And I got spit on, called a baby killer. Uh, and I just said, I can't take this. Um, and so I packed my van and took off. One day I went out riding, up, saw this path that said Appalachian Mountain Trail. So I did a hike up into the woods, up in Mount Washington. And I found a nice little spot, a nice little cave. I said, this is beautiful. So I would sit there, lived in the cave, played guitar, wrote in my journal, and that became my home. One day I went in to get my mail in the post office, and there was a, a note that said, um, be down at the local inn at 6 o'clock. There's a phone call for you coming in from Washington. Fix this, I'm in this old New England country inn talking on the phone. By that time, my hair is down to here. I'm, and I go, hello, and he goes, yeah, this is the Gary Biker that was with the 5th Special Forces. I said, yeah. But he said, um, it's my pleasure and my honor to tell you you've been awarded the Medal of Honor. And I remember distinctly saying, oh. And that was it, it you know, all of a sudden, everything started coming back. And it was, things that I've been trying to forget, things that I went to a cave to hide from, um, all came back. President Nixon gave us the medal, and um, afterwards, I stayed in my motel room. I didn't feel like celebrating. I, I'd had a real tough time remembering all that stuff again. And many of the guys in the society will tell you that for years, I did not participate in any events. I wouldn't come to the inaugurals. I wouldn't come to conventions, um, because I didn't, I still don't feel worthy. Um, but it was, it was just too difficult of a thing for me to bear. But I've, um, there's a verse in the Psalms that says that man that is in honor and understands not is like a beast that perishes. And I've come to understand that um, what this medal represents, is not, it's not about me. And it's not about anything that I've done, but it's about men and women who value something so strongly that they'd be willing to die for it. And they'd be willing to defend our country for it. And so they put on the uniform. And for every man and woman who puts on that uniform and puts themselves in a position where they have to defend or may die from the country, that's what this medal represents now. It's a symbol of, of a valuing of something greater than self. It's a tremendous, tremendous legacy. It's a tremendous, 
tremendous honor to be able to hold something like this and wear it.